Hi folks, how are you doing? How is the post-lunch coma treating you? Do you want to get up and just stretch? Yeah, anyone? You know? Uh, so, what I want to share with you today is one contention. Um, that we can create a design-powered planet. Let me explain what that is. You know, we all live in these times where we're uneasy, right? It seems unclear how the future is going to unfold. There just seem to be a host of issues surrounding us. And I believe that we can actually address a lot of the issues facing us by actually unleashing the creativity of every human being on this planet by using the power of design. So, obviously, I'm a design nut, right? Obviously, I'm a, I've always been a design nut. Ever since I was young, I have really had a passion for, here, let's do this. I've had a passion for design. Uh, when I was a child in India, you know, I'd go excitedly to my teachers, my parents, and say, you know, I want to be a designer. I want to design all these things, these beautiful cars. I want to design all these beautiful buildings. And they would get, uh, they'd say, that sounds exciting. And you know, you are free to do whatever you like. Uh, so which one would you be, a doctor or an engineer, right? <laughs> so obviously, my mom was speaking with Benjamin's mom, who's not, right? <laughs> so, any case, I went ahead and became a designer, and it kind of turned out okay. Um, I ended up uh, getting the opportunity to design a bunch of products that billions of people end up using uh, because I worked at Microsoft and other places, and I also became a professor of design, so I got to train a whole bunch of people in design. And uh, I spent about 16 years at Microsoft uh, running the central design team for most of that time. And about two and a half years ago, I had this moment where was, there was a project that was a real epiphany. So this was a project. So we had a new CEO, Satya Nadella, and he came to a few of us and said, I want to transform this company. I want us to think in different ways. So I want you to create a hackathon where the entire company, 120,000 of us in 69 countries, we will take two days to hack together. <laughs> so we said, OK, when do you want this done? He said, six weeks from now. So he said, OK, all right. <laughs> so anyway, we did it. And there was a few projects there that blew my mind. And this one, I was intimately involved with this particular project that you see on the screen. And this was a project to be able to help folks who have ALS. So folks who have this condition where they lose all capabilities except the ability to move their eyes and to give them independence and to create a wheelchair that could actually be driven around by somebody with just their eyes. And so, you know, there's a group of folks who came together and they used Kinect and they used different technologies and they built great user empathy. And they had a person as part of the team who had ALS. And remarkably, after 38 hours, there was this wheelchair going around where there was this gentleman, Steve Gleason, who was navigating it just his eyes, right? And for me, I thought, there are all these projects I've been involved with for so long. And there have been you know, projects that I've worked on for two years and three years to try to get to the same point. And usually, they end up getting canceled. So something was happening here that changed my view. And what it really changed was when you can get a passionate group of people together who are working at where the center of innovation happens today, which is the intersection of passion, purpose, and profit, magic happens. And when you can have people who intimately know their lives and are actually designing, even if they are not trained designers, magic happens. You know, and you can solve incredibly difficult problems that seemed unsolvable in very short times. And this kind of turned, you know, as a professor of design forever, I taught in the Bauhaus tradition the idea of the design superstar, the expert designer who designs for others, who understands problems and uses this method that you know, has been dominant for the past 100 years. Right? They're special people with special skills who wear special glasses and black who do the designing. Right? And they design for the rest of us, the ordinary mortals. 
right? And this has been the driving force for the architecture movement, for Brown and Apple and everything in design. And this really turned that around. And I had to really think about this powerful uh, technique of really stakeholders and designers and cross-functional people coming together in very short times at high velocity, taking on high uncertainty together, creates magic. So I said, what if we actually start to use it in other places now? And it turns out, this is where I live, um, uh, Seattle. And Seattle's this beautiful place, but unfortunately, it also has a big problem. See, the mayor of Seattle declared a crisis in Seattle of homelessness, and particularly homelessness of women. There are over 500 women who are homeless every night in Seattle. And so we thought, you know, this has been such an intractable, difficult problem to take on. All efforts to solve this have really, uh, haven't made too much progress. We said, what if I take this particular technique that I learned and start to actually empower people to solve this? And so I created this method called design swarms, which I'll tell you a little bit about. But fundamentally, it is a design thinking process and actually brought together folks who were homeless or folks who had experienced homelessness and paired them with other passionate people, and together, in the course of one day, we took on these problems in different teams. And again, the results astonished me, because we came to epiphanies that would not have been possible by designing from a distance. So when people are designing for themselves, they start to truly understand their lives and have insights that you know, can really propel solutions forward. And here the insight was this. When a woman becomes homeless, very often, she loses not just a roof over her head, she loses her identity. And her identity in very practical ways. She loses her identity because they're probably her documents, like her driver's license and her passport and birth certificate, which may have been withheld from her because of some bad issue going on in a, in a, a domestic abuse problem. And then she has to flee home at two in the morning with none of these documents and is able to, unable to authenticate herself and therefore cannot actually use the social net. And so based on that, in this one day, this group of people who were these folks who mostly untrained designers designed the system called Identity Haven and not only designed it, but even prototyped it, built it on Google Docs, deployed it, and by the end of the day, we had a solution that actually worked. And there was somebody there who saw the results, put down $10,000, and now it runs at a homeless shelter. So again, I was thinking, this is amazing what's happening here. This is really amazing that you know, we can do these things so quickly. And so I think, you know, we have got a bunch of problems which we could call the class of wicked problems. Wicked problems are a particular class of problems that designers love to talk about, which is problems that are so complex, so volatile, that when you try and solve the problem, it actually becomes even harder, right? And design tends to be particularly good at dealing with wicked problems. And here is a classic wicked problem, which is about a sixth of the kids on the planet go hungry every night, and about a sixth of the food on the planet gets thrown away. The fresh food gets thrown away. And we live in this planet right now with millions of these wicked problems, these paradoxes in health where you know half the disease is about malnutrition, the other half are over, about overnutrition. And we see them all around us. You know, we see that the, we are, not surprisingly, we have the largest refugee crisis that we have seen in a hundred years. We are starting to see when there is environmental disasters, they are of a scale that will have an impact a century from now, right? We start to see um, uh, extinction of species at just an alarming rate. We are losing something like 10 to 20 species per week, right? If you look at the, um, the picture of the rhino, that is the last living white rhino on the planet being protected by these guards. And if you think about it, it's particularly, what's particularly tragic is that the white rhino has been around for 50 million years. Okay? If 50 million years were a year, the rhino has been around for that long. Humans showed up on December 29th, right? And the rhino is going to be gone soon, right? So we live in this 
at this particular moment in history where all of these issues are actually turning around and starting to impact our lives and we start to think, so, you know, what happens here? How is this going to unfold? I'm sorry for the doom and gloom uh, in this talk, but, you know, because I actually am incredibly optimistic. I think we live in a time where while we are really worried about the direction we are going, I think, you know, you know that phrase is the darkest hour before the dawn? I think we are in that and I start to see the change where there is actually a lot of really amazing creativity that is happening all over the world. And I travel a lot and I meet people who are doing very creative things and I see it everywhere on the planet. This is a, a, a do-it-yourself refugee tent created by an architect from Jordan which harvests rainwater and harvests solar, uh, 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 solar energy and can actually be made by refugees. And uh, uh, this is a lady, name is Kavita Shukla, and she has figured out a very simple, elegant solution to be able to protect all that fresh food that goes waste by actually having a piece of paper dipped in some spices that keeps food fresh, right? And she is in her early 20s. This is David Senge. And he learned about 3D printing and learned about uh, that at MIT, went back to Sierra Leone, and he's created these village collectives and some primitive 3D models where people can actually go to a lab and build themselves a prosthetic foot and literally walk out of there. And this is the work of Boyan Slat, who is the 16-year-old Dutch um, man who is building these enormous booms on the planet to clean the five big garbage patches on the planet where plastic particulate has been collecting. And guess what? The first one is being deployed and it's cleaning the ocean today, right? 16 years old. And these three young ladies from Nigeria, also 16, they're just cool kids, but they have invented this generator that creates power from P, right? With no technical background. And this man is only 13, Shubham Banerjee. And he found that there are 50 million folks who are blind around the planet. And it's very expensive to get a braille printer. And so he took Lego Mindstorms and mocked this up together. So this creativity is amazing. And this one blows me away totally. This is Richard Terere, who's a Maasai kid. And like many Maasai kids, he had been tasked by his parents to look after the cattle and keep them safe from the lions. Now typically what happens is to get uh, to solve that problem, people just put a spoonful of insecticides and a lot of lions die from that. And he figured out that lions get scared of moving lights and hooked up this device which now is scaring lions away all over Africa, right? He did it when he was nine years old. The key point here is there is this burst of creativ creativity on our planet. And so my ambition, my dream has been, how can I take all those things that I've spent 25 years of my life teaching and training to actually harness that raw creativity of all of these humans and put it into the process that we know is the design process and make that accessible to everybody in very simple ways. So I've devised this a simple technique called design swarms. It's really a game board. And in this game board, people can actually take hard problems, work through them, together and work through, use a kit. And part of that kit is a physical kit, some of it is a digital kit, and they just work through solving these problems as they are um, working through the game board. And the results have just blown me away as, you know, I've taken this uh, around the world and had people uh, take on problems in their lives and solve it. So there are people who work uh, partly physically, partly they also bring in remote uh, stakeholders, and uh, they use some digital tools to help with that. And the, the kinds of things that people have solved are really quite astonishing. This is a group that came together using a design swamp and they created in a day a prototype to clean up microparticulates from oceans. And it's deployed now and it's cleaning oceans. Um, we, uh, another uh, group looked, uh, took on waterborne diseases in Kenya and created an educational um, program by young children, which is being deployed now in Kenya. Another group um, looked at the problems of favelas in Brazil and uh, used rainwater harvesting to solve it. And another one uh, up 
uh, north of the Arctic Circle use the same method to be able to deal with issues of elderly um, uh, feeling abandoned. So, you know, uh, what has been really gratifying is to see the adoption of this process and all the people are using it. So my key point here is really, we are at such an interesting crossroads. We are at a point where we get to make a choice here on our planet. You know, we get to be able to actually unleash the creativity of the planet to take on these problems and it is within our grasp to solve it. And I believe, again, what my dream is and what really I wake up to do is actually to power the richer terrarias of the world so that they can use design to be able to solve the big problems in their lives. Thank you very much.